So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this public seminar today. So let's begin with the presentation of our assessment of the DOH EPI. Right. So here's the framework of the study and the contents of the presentation. First, we will start with an overview of the end goal of any immunization program, which is to decrease the burden of vaccine preventable diseases, especially in children. Then we will look into the intermediate outcomes of immunization coverage and the timeliness of immunization that influence this burden, uh, as well as the equity of uh, performance subnationally in the country. Last, we will look into possible supply and demand side reasons for uh, our intermediate outcomes and also give some recommendations for the EPN. Okay, so to review the, D the DOH expanded program of immunization was established in 1976 through a presidential decree and reinforced in 2011 by another Republic Act. So the goal is really to provide children with access to life-saving vaccines and reduce uh, the burden of disease for select diseases. So at its core, on the right table, you will see there are six basic vaccines and they cover around eight common diseases. So like TB, hepatitis B, polio, um, tetanus, and measles, right? So there is no question that the morbidity and mortality due to vaccine-preventable diseases, such as measles, mumps, and polio, has declined significantly, significantly after the introduction of the EPI in 1976. Um, the DOH EPI has actually done a remarkable job sustaining the gains uh, since 1990s, where the VPV burden really declined sharply. However, our current situation on the right side of the slide is that we see occasional outbreaks. The most uh, alarming and uh, publicized would be the measles outbreaks in 2014, 2018, and 2019. And also the two cases of polio in 2019 after we were declared polio free in 2000. These occasional outbreaks reflect longstanding problems of low vaccination coverage and untimely administration of vaccines um, that really lead to a failure to reach and maintain herd immunity levels. So we'll go to the intermediate outcomes. So this graph shows how immunization coverage for the proportion of children vaccinated in the past three decades has really been unstable. We were, we were doing quite well in the 2000s, 2012 to 2012, for all basic vaccines. For some vaccines, we actually reached the 95% coverage for BCG and the first doses of DPT and polio. Um, then around 2013, 2014, coverage suddenly declined for all the vaccines. And in 2016, only 70% of all children completed all their vaccine, their basic vaccine. Um, since the 1990s, we have never reached um, the 95% coverage for all the vaccines. Okay. We have for individual vaccines, but not for the basic set. Okay. So comparing Philippine immunization coverage in the red line in this graph, compared to the global average in black and to other countries in the other shades. When EPI started in the 1980s, Philippine immunization coverage was more than twice that of the global average. Um, but over time, uh, we struggled to maintain the gains made in the 1990s, while countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia, and Laos, um, they su successfully increased their coverage and maintained it. In, in contrast to the present, um, most ASEAN countries have indeed uh, maintained their coverage. And currently in 2017 and 2018, the Philippine immunization coverage has, is the lowest in the ASEAN region or among our ASEAN neighbors. And they're even lower uh, compared to some of the poorest countries in Sub-Saharan Africa listed here in the bottom of the slide. Look at, looking at equity of the coverage across our regions, uh, we see that immunization coverage um, was also characterized by large fluctuations, similar to the national trend. There was also a consistent decline in 2013, similar to national declines. Um, and the decline is especially alarming in three regions, namely region six on the top slide here, Western Visayas, um, region 12, lower left, and ARMM. In the ARMM, we never had reached a basic vaccination coverage more than 50%. So that is a particularly um, alarming region. Uh, in this 
uh, it is this fluctuation of coverage that really enables uh, the disease outbreak. So on this graph on the right, you will see the red line represents measles cases and the yellow line's basic vaccine coverage. Okay, The measles outbreak in 2017, the spike in the red line, um, can be attributed to the large to the declines in coverage in the prior year. So there was already a downward trend from 2010 to 2013 for uh, vaccination coverage, and that precipitated in the spike of measles cases in 2014, which we consider an outbreak. Aside from coverage, timeliness of immunization is increasingly gaining importance as a global metric for EPI performance. So what does timeliness mean? Timeliness means that children get their vaccines according to their immunization schedule or in a certain recommended age range. For example, children should receive their first dose of polio vaccine between six to eight weeks after birth. Okay. The timeliness of immunization is necessary for optimal immune response, and literature has documented outbreaks in other countries despite high coverage. So based on our numbers from the 2017 Demographic Health Survey, depending on the vaccine, you will see on the left, um, around 40 to 50 percent, only around 40 to 50 percent of children get their vaccines in the, within the recommended age ranges or times. So, um, Overall, even if we say have a 70% basic vaccination coverage, 70% uh, of our children get all their vaccines um, at some point in time, only 7% of those children um, get them within the recommended age range, according to our analysis. So the median delay uh, per antigen or per vaccine range from 20 to 60 days on the bottom of the slide. Um, the delays are particularly greater among doses in a series, like the third dose of PDPT or polio. Um, in terms of equity of coverage and timeliness in, among socioeconomic classes, there is a clear socioeconomic gradient. What does this mean? This means that the immunization coverage and timeliness um, are higher in richer socioeconomic classes and lower for the um, bottom 60% or bottom 20% of the population. So you can see that by comparing the blue bars and the or, or lines and the orange bars for lines. So to try to explain the trends in immunization coverage and timeliness, we looked into the EPI inputs at the national level. While the fund factors like vaccine confidence have contributed to declines, um, the, the trend is really due to recurring supply system challenges in the DOH. Okay. So first, looking at the demand side of vaccine confidence, the graph on the screen shows the uh, coverage for DP3, DPT3, a tracer indicator. This is the last vaccine in the series for children before measles. So the coverage is represented in the blue line, uh, and that's the proportion. Uh, the, okay, and the orange bars represent public perception of how safe vaccines are. Okay. So we mark the occurrence of Dengvaksha, the Dengvaksha controversy by the red dotted red line in 2017. Okay. The graph shows that coverage was low in 2014, even before, uh, even before the Dengvaksha um, issue. Okay. It recovered a bit in 2016 um, and then declined again in post Dengvaksha. Um, but overall, the vaccine coverage, vaccine confidence seems to be improving over time. Um, so this is why we, we believe that vaccine confidence contributes but does not entirely explain the fluctuations in coverage in the past decades. Rather, the supply side issues that remain during this period really contributed to uh, the performance. Okay, so for the supply side, let's start with national stock. National stockouts have been common in the past decade. So the table on top table uh, shows that the shows the duration of stockouts at national storage, that is the RITM, per vaccine. Okay, in 2013 to 2015, there were persistent stockouts in the pentavalent vaccine. The pentavalent vaccine covers five vaccine preventable diseases. Okay, the stockouts reached nine months in 2013 and 2015, and later we will see that it's because of failed local buildings. In more recent years at the bottom table, in 2016 to 2019, the bottom table shows whether we have excess or deficits at the national warehouses. So we really have difficulty maintaining stocks or and also buffer stocks for vaccines like polio, pentavalent, uh, measles, and hepatitis B, right? 
Going through procurement, in recent years, the DOH has been attempting to procure vaccines directly from local manufacturers, which typically undergo a competitive procurement process. Local procurement is part of the country's long-term effort towards vaccine independence. Okay, so, but it is, uh, has been contributing to national stockouts. Um, the table on the right shows the procurement um, results of the EPI from 2013 to 2019. The number of bid failures are enclosed in parentheses. Okay. Negotiated procurement, uh, particularly with UNICEF, UNICEF, was prominent in the years 2013, 2014, 2017, and 2018. Local bidding was done in 2015, 2016, and recently in 2019. Okay. So what happens is when local tenders fail, the government re resorts to emergency procurement with UNICEF later in the year when stockouts are occurring. So the trend in local bidding failures for basic vaccines, uh, you can see in the re uh, red highlighted cell. Um, there were really a lot of bid failures in 2015. And so we shifted to UN procurement in the next years and then tried again in 2017. So a closer look for the bid failures. Um, so 2015 was a particularly bad year for local procurement. Um, there, we can see that this is the, the field biddings were in BCG, pentavalent, and measles, uh, which explains the previous slide of having nine months of stock outs for certain vaccines. And when we now actually try to procure, um, procurement typically follows a one-year procurement period. Okay, the figure shows the detailed steps in vaccine procurement and the times it takes for each step. Okay, uh, we can pay attention to the boxes highlighted in red. Okay, so more than half of all awarded bids for the EPI vaccines take more than 106 days. Um, and the bottlenecks are really those in the red boxes. So they occur um, in the post qualification notice of award and the contract sign. So that takes around half um, the total time for the procurement. Um, once we get the vaccines, um, now we have to store them in our national warehouses. So in terms of national storage and distribution, DOH has limited capacity to accommodate the vaccine supplies. Um, it has no room for additional physical expansion at the RITM. Uh, RITM can only accommodate around three months supply of all these basic vaccines. Um, so that means it cannot, uh, uh, it means that their delivery of vaccines to lower levels to the uh, local governments, provinces, must be that done in four tranches yearly. Um, and ideally you would stock three to six months of buffer stock, uh, but it's not, that is not possible with the limited space. Um, so when now when they distribute it to the LGUs, there's really a lack of an organized system. Um, DOH hires third party logistics companies, but they also have difficulty fulfilling the quarterly deliveries, not just of the vaccines, but also other DOH supplies. Um, there are also some issues with delayed payments for the logistics companies, which cause delays because they pause deliveries. Um, and lastly, there is really no electronic monitoring system to inventory vaccines and supplies. Um, knowledge of stock and where stock goes ends at the regional level. In terms of budget allocation, the EPI is clearly a priority program of the Department of Health. Um, you can see on the graph how, but how much budget has changed over time, over the years. So, uh, it, it, it received significant funds from the state taxes, particularly in 2012. Okay, so pre-2010, you can see that budget was less than 1 billion pesos. Um, but in 2020, uh, now we have 7.3 billion for the EPI. That's around 7.2% of DOH's 100 billion budget. Um, and that represents around a fourfold increase from 2013 to the present time. However, if you look closely at the EPI's budget, um, there is a lack of priority for systems building and ensuring basic vaccination or support for basic vaccination is strong at the primary healthcare level. Okay, on the right um, is a breakdown of where the budget has been spent for 2017 and 2018. So you can see that cent taxes were used to uh, more or less buy additional vaccines to include in the program, such as rotavirus, human papillomavirus, and Japanese encephalitis. 
particularly PCV or the new uh, pneumococcal vaccine takes around 60% of the EPI's budget. Um, so in essence, EPI continues to expand vaccines, including more and more vaccines past the basic set without commensurate increases in, say, staffing at the national level, uh, regional levels, LGU levels, um, no increases or investments in cold chain capacity, LGU capacity to store and deliver at point of care, the DOH capacity to monitor, and also service delivery channels. Okay. And for service delivery channels, uh, what we mean by lack of blessed is we are still using the same model as we have used since 1976. Uh, with little or no change. So if the model is really a government-centric model uh, that is publicly financed and publicly delivered. Okay. What this means is the central government manages the entire supply chain, the stock procurement, monitoring, um, and then local government is the primary um, service delivery point for immunization services to the primary care facilities. So there's literally limited collaboration and um, communication with the private sector um, in terms of how to uh, expand service delivery into private providers. Uh, last, we will end with the uh, recommendations. So our recommendations are divided into three broad goals over the short and medium term. Short Term recommendations are about immediately addressing supply side constraints, and medium terms term ones are more about innovations in EPI systems. The first school is about expediting procurement and ensuring the stability of national supply of vaccines. In the short term, DOH should really consider uh, procuring other basic vaccines from UNICEF and utilizing DBM's uh, multi year obligation authority, where you can contract a, a, a party over more than one year, okay. and also investigate and resolve the delays uh, in the procurement process. In the medium term, there needs to be more decision, uh, a more stable source of the vaccine and a decision, a decision on where we are going to source our vaccine supplies. Will that be UNICEF, will that be parallel importation, or will that be local capacity to manufacture? So some other countries have decided to uh, procure primarily through UNICEF or imports. The second, the second goal is about investing in system strengthening for EPI and not solely purchase new vaccines. In the short term, this means augmenting the quantity and skills of the EPI staff in the DOH central office um, and updating and allocating budget for things like expanding storage capacity, vaccine distribution, and soft components like capacity building for LGU service delivery providers. Okay. Long term, EPI may think of tapping the private sector and take, taking advantage of field health financing and the UHC law, which requires designated primary health care positions. For efficiency, um, DOH may explore being the sole procurer, but being able to distribute both the public and private sector, or even contracting out parts of the supply chain. Um, the last goal is about monitoring and evaluation. Um, short term, EPI may focus on technical assistance um, to LGUs uh, that really have low vaccine coverage and addressing the inequities in timeliness and coverage among those uh, areas. It can also start thinking about the timeliness of vaccination as additional performance metric and investing in electronic systems to monitor logistics and stock, um, such as what they have uh, started, uh, a web-based vaccine inventory with our ITM. So long term, uh, a good thing would be to establish an electronic immunization registry, taking advantage of the new national ID system, which could give EPI counts for need assessment uh, and distribution of stock to LGUs and not just base it on projections and census data. Okay. This could also help in identifying children for catch up vaccinations and help uh, DOH and um, EPI move from uh, limited uh, limited and untimely national surveys like the NDHS or the FHSIS. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much for listening.